first of all to start the topic excretory product and their elimination why is excretion even necessary so when we talk about the excretion so as a biological organism right so we obtain several different materials from outside in the form of food or in the form of gas like air oxygen right for running our body so first part that is we obtain uh, various kinds of materials from outside in the form of food what i just told so you know that when you eat a vegetable or egg or a chicken or fish or any other as a food product what happens in your body we understood that in digestion and absorption that these particles or this complex food gets broken down enzymatically and they're converted into simpler forms so during this conversion what happens it gets absorbed in the blood bloodstream as simpler material and our tissues again absorb them and then what happens is uh, sometimes uh, the byproducts of this entire catabolic and anabolic reactions will lead to uh, some of the formation of toxins which are very very harmful for our tissues for example the byproduct of our metabolism that is production of our energy it produces carbon dioxide as a waste and we know what happens if the carbon dioxide accumulates in our body when carbon dioxide accumulates in our body what happens your brain shuts down right and your tissues undergo carbon dioxide poisoning so that is why it has to be eliminated through the process of expiration right you breathe out similarly if we take some of the products like amino acids and lipids what happens is they form some of the very harmful waste in the form of nitrogenous wastes so these nitrogenous waste have to be taken out of the system because they are very very toxic to the tissues so to regulate uh, one thing the amount of toxics the toxins that are accumulating in our body that is the first thing and the second thing is to maintain proper homeostasis or the balance in the fluid mechanism because our blood uh, balance uh, with respect to the fluids it has to be very very perfect um, so that uh, our system can run under right ph under right conditions without any uh, problems so in this chapter we're going to talk about what are the different types of excretion or excretory systems that are present across different animals and uh, also human excretory system then we'll talk about what is the process of urine formation and in the next session we'll be talking about what is countercurrent mechanisms what is micturation and regulation of kidney functions and disorders okay so let's start with the first thing as i told you excretion is a process of elimination of metabolic waste it can be urea ammonia uric acid carbon dioxide okay and many of the ions like potassium sodium etc so this is called as excretion so when we talk about excretion excretion is a very novel design in all the organisms and the complexity of the way we excrete uh, changes from one level of the organism or uh, organisms to the uh, other level of organisms so if you see in lower organisms and many of the organisms uh, that are in the lower forms and as well as in the higher forms uh, we can divide this entire animals into three important uh, uh, types what are those one is ammonotelic and next one is ureotelic and next one is uricotelic so it is also called as ammonotelism ure uh, ureotelism and then uricotelism so why did we differentiate them into three different forms see what happens is based on the type of the toxic material that is accumulating in our uh, body hold on one second yeah based on the type of uh, excretory product that is accumulating in our body uh, so it requires a special treatment for example if i talk about ammonia ammonia is a very very toxic waste uh, to be produced in the body and remember this uh, of ammonia requires tremendous amount of water it requires large amount of water to get rid of this ammonia so that is why in lower organisms like for example if you take fishes okay i can't tell lower organisms but if i take an example of aquatic invertebrates or aquatic insects or bony fishes or aquatic amphibians if i take these examples they live in aquatic environment 
So what happens is this ammonia waste, it accumulates in that body surface, such as gill surfaces, etc. And then they slowly get removed by interacting with the external environment. That is plenty of water on them. But the same thing cannot happen uh, with the higher vertebrates, such as us, because uh, for us to remove uh, ammonia using such large amounts of water would be impossible. Uh, or it would uh, create such a huge uh, problem for us because we have to keep ingesting water uh, okay, uh, on a very high amount, which is not possible, right? We are not designed like that. So in a similar manner, when we talk about ammonia, just taking one, one as a toxic waste, ammonia as a toxic waste, we understood that to remove ammonia, we require a lot of water. So where can ammonia waste, that is when an animal excretes, which type of animals can we see that they excrete ammonia? The examples are aquatic invertebrates, aquatic insects, bony fishes, aquatic amphibians, etc. Right? So how do they do it? So they do it by interacting with the external environment. The waste through circulation accumulates to their body surface, especially near the gill regions. Right? And here, uh, because of the interaction with the water, a large amount of water will basically remove this ammonia waste. So since they excrete this ammonia, they are called as ammonotelic organisms, or it is also called as uh, ammonotelism. And this cannot happen in many of the organisms that are coming in the higher categories. You can take an example of cartilaginous fishes, such as sharks, okay? And then uh, you have terrestrial and semi-aquatic amphibians, such as frogs, toads, etc., or aquatic and semi-aquatic reptiles, such as alligators or turtles and even mammals okay such as zebra horses etc so what they do is even us in including us and them but there is a small difference here I'll, I'll point it out so what happens is these organisms when the ammonia when do ammonia accumulate that is the first question right so why do we get ammonia see 98 percent of our biological functions happen uh, because of proteins, correct? And, uh, let me write it here. So, what, uh, what, how, why ammonia is such an important topic here? It's because majority of our uh, biological functions happen because of what protein, right? So, while the process of uh, metabolizing protein, that is, uh, our body breaks down these proteins into peptides, peptides into uh, amino acids. And some of the amino acids are used for the construction of the protein and other amino acids, they accumulate and they're degenerated as ammonia. So ammonia is accumulated as a waste, as a byproduct of uh, metabolism. So now I told you about how toxic is ammonia and how much water it requires. It requires a large amount of water for the removal. So that's why we have one set of organisms. And the second set of organisms, the same way, we have two different organisms, one that secretes urea, Okay, and the other that secretes uric acid. So here what happens is the one that secretes urea are, are cartilaginous fishes such as sharks, terrestrial and semi-aquatic amphibians, frogs and toads, and aquatic or semi-aquatic reptiles such as alligators or reptiles and some of the mammals, they all uh, secrete urea. What happens is ammonia, which is in their tissues, accumulated in the tissues, is sent to the liver. Okay. So the liver will convert this ammonia into less toxic urea. So ammonia is very toxic. So the liver helps in conversion of this ammonia into urea waste. Next, what happens? This urea is filtered out, okay, through through the form of in the form of uh, kidneys. Okay, the um, the urea is moved to okay, uh, through the filtration process. And the complexity of the kidneys, what type of kidneys they have also varies. You cannot just tell that the mammals and the frogs have the same kidney or the reptiles and the frogs have the same kidney. No, the complexity of this kidneys also vary, but the, the, the mechanism is simple. The mechanism is they remove urea uh, by conversion of ammonia into urea, uh, primarily in the liver. And after from the liver it is converted, it is sent back to the kidneys for the removal. Okay, so whichever the organism that removes urea, they are called as what? Ureotelic organisms. Next we have is uricotelism. What is uricotelism? Excretion of uric acid is called as uricotelism. 
So here, what happens? Example, you, you can see here. Uh, we we belong here in the uh, you know humans belong in urea uh, that is mammals. Okay, we we are mammals, right? So we are uh, ureo or uh, telic organisms. Whereas we have uricotelism, such as insects and some land crustaceans such as crabs and land snails and terrestrial reptiles and birds. So what do they do is they convert into uric acid. So you can see in the birds that white color, uh, you know, slime in the form of uh, excretory product they, exc they excrete. So they're very rich in uric acid. The same mechanism happens where uh, it, it is sent back to the liver for the conversion of ammonia into uric acid. Okay. And then they are uh, excreted. So if you see what's the difference between these organisms, ammonotelism organism need excessive amount of water and it is very highly toxic. Okay. Whereas ureotelism require moderate amount of water such as us, whereas uricotelism, it produce uric acids in such that it becomes insoluble in water. Okay. So that is why if you have ever observed, I know it's funny, if you have ever observed uh, a, a situation where a bird has uh, dropped his waist on a car or your vehicle or anything when you wash it off it's very hard right it does not just simply wash off like paint or uh, you know uh, something like that so it it just becomes very oily and sticky and greasy that is because the uh, uric acid is insoluble in water so that is what makes the now, if you see the complexity of how the excretory system is organized in different organisms. Now, uh, not every organism is, uh, you know, uh, built with complex kidneys and, uh, uh, and, and the mechanism of kidneys are highly regulated with hormonal mechanism. No, we, there is an evolutionary process in which the even kidneys have evolved. So we can see from the lower organisms to the higher organisms how it varies. For example, in many of the proto-nephridia, they have something called as flame cells. So we have seen in the earlier chapters, while we are studying animal kingdom, we came across the cells called as flame cells. So the flame cells perform the function of kidney. And examples are platyhelminthes, rotifers, and some of the annelids, and even uh, cephalocordata oh, and other annelids, they show what happened? And nothing. Uh, they show uh, they, they show the presence of this flame cells. Okay, and uh, other one is the presence of nephridia. So the nephridia is shown in exclusively in uh, animals. So usually you will have be asked a question. What about proto-nephridia? The proto-nephridia type of kidney or, or excretory system is uh, present in what category of organisms or what group of organisms? So it is totally linked with your animal kingdom. So that is why the question from this is highly expected. So the example for proto-nephridia kind of excretory system or flame cells come with platyhelminthes, rotifers, and some of the annelids and cephalocordata. Whereas coming to nephridia, nephridia is exclusively seen in some of the uh, in most of the annelids, not some of the annelids, in most of the annelids. All right. So coming to malfigant tubules. So you might have studied in structural organisms, uh, a structural organization in animals, where we talk about cockroach, and we saw about malfigant tubules, several tubules that are attached to the, uh, you know, the gut lining. You can see that there is a gut. Okay, in the mid gut region, you can see that there are several malfigant tubules uh, that are attached to the elementary canal of the cockroach and these malfigant tubules they perform like kidneys and then they uh, start filtering out the toxic waste that is present in the gut okay so this is about malfigant tubules and most of the uh, insects have malfigant tubules next one is green glands or this is also called as uh, antennal glands so some of the prawns or crustacean prawns they show the presence of green glands which is similar to that of your malfigant tubules Okay, next one is kidneys. Kidneys are found in higher uh, animals such as mammals. So it is uh, quite complex in their structure. Now, coming to human excretory system. So a human excretory system is quite complex, right? So the human excretory system has uh, these many parts. One is it shows the presence of a pair of kidneys, correct? And the pair of kidneys have a pair of ureters. So ureters are the one that carries the filtered urine from the kidney 
and all the way it runs down to the pelvic region where it comes in contact with the urinary bladder okay it comes in contact with the urinary bladder and finally the urinary bladder opens into urethra where uh, the urine uh, is excreted out of the body now coming to uh, how the kidney is designed uh, right or how the excretory system is designed it's a very well mechanized system uh, you might have uh, observed that the way your body reacts when the urine formation takes place or when the urine is filled up in the bladder how do you get to know that the urine is filling up in the bladder right and why do you get the urge of urinating okay and uh, the anatomy of human uh, excretory system and uh, that that differ differs with the female excretory system right so we have some of the questions that we need to answer while we talk about the uh, physiology of the human excretory system so anyways we'll start with the ki the kidneys itself so when we talk about the kidney uh, we might have seen from our primary uh, you know from our, from our primary classes that the kidney is a bean shaped structure so it looks like rajma correct right or it's also called as kidney beans right so it looks like a, a you know bean shaped structure and this bean shaped structure is a very very important structure when it comes to uh, the body balance i can tell so uh, the kidney is enclosed in three layers okay there are three layers which is called as a fibrous capsule see you can see that a three layered capsule encloses the entire kidney okay and where is the kidney located now this is the the last rib is your thoracic chamber the last thoracic uh, layer so if you just come to come laterally to your uh, thoracic uh, okay thoracic chamber you can come to the last vertebrae that is last thoracic vertebrae thoracic means your your chest chamber or your the anything that is enclosed within the ribs is called as thoracic region so you see the last vertebrae vertebrae means the backbone uh, backbone right the last vertebrae of the thoracic cavity that is where laterally okay in the dorsal side okay in the dorsal wall you can you can get your kidneys okay so the thoracic and the third lumbar vertebrae okay that is between the last thoracic and the third lumbar lumbar means what uh, it is uh, below the thoracic okay just below the rib cage whatever the uh, you see whatever the vertebral uh, bones you get they are called as uh, lumbar vertebrae okay so the thoracic last thoracic vertebrae to third lumbar vertebrae is where your kidney is located okay so now coming to uh, the location of the kidney as i told you they are present or uh, they are attached to the dorsal wall uh, of your uh, of your of your body okay and here each of the kidney is around 10 to 12 centimeter in length and 5 to 7 centimeter in width and 2 to centimeter 2 to 3 centimeter in thickness so now you can understand that this thickness comes because of the fibrous capsule that is present around the kidney now coming to the weight of the kidney each kidney weighs around 120 to 170 grams okay now uh, if you look at the kidney the structure of the kidney what you can see is the kidney is completely enclosed with this capsule okay all around but at one medial portion you can see that there is a dent or there is a notch okay there is a notch or a dent where you can find that all of the things that are coming from the outside or from the inside exit and enter at the same point so you cannot see that any blood vessel coming from here or any of the urinary bladder are coming out of here no right it is coming exactly at one particular point so this notch where the uh, ureter comes out okay and as well as the blood vessels enter or exit this point of entry or the, this point of exit is called as hilum region so what is hilum hilum is a uh, region or it is a notch which is present in the inner concave surface okay this is called as a concave surface of the kidney this is the convex surface of the kidney so here at the concave surface of the kidney you can come across a notch and this notch is called as hilum so what is the significance of hilum hilum is a point where all the uh, you know uh, urinary duct or ureters okay and the blood vessels we call it as afferent arteries afferent veins efferent arteries efferent veins they enter and exit the kidney okay next one is the nerves also enter the kidney at the same region 
So that is why the hilum is very, very important. Now, once the hilum, okay, once the, you know, ureter, so you can see here, if you just follow the ureter, it becomes very simple for us. So once the ureter makes an entry into the hilum, what happens is the hilum opens into a very broad funnel-like structures. So this funnel-like structure, this entire region, this funnel-like structure in which the ureter opens after it enters into the hilum. So this is called as, okay, one second. Yeah. See, you can hold on. I'll just... Okay, so you can see that this region in which it has entered, so this uh, this whole funnel-like structure, it is called as renal pelvis. Okay, so the renal pelvis is a funnel-like structure that opens after the ureter enters into the kidneys through hilum. Okay, once it has, see, uh, you know that the ureter came, it actually it exits, but let's say that we are going from ureter into the kidney. So it went, it, it, it just passed the hilum. So the hilum opened into, uh, you know, as it passed into the hilum, you can see that there is a broad funnel like structure, and this broad funnel like structure is called as renal pelvis. Now, this renal pelvis, they have projections, okay, they have projections like this it opens into projections like this and these projections are called as renal calyx okay what are they called as renal calyx or it is also called as calyces okay calyces in the plural calyx in the singular form so what happened this is your ureter and then as it entered the hilum it opened into a broad funnel -like, funnel like structure which is called as renal pelvis and this renal pelvis okay it created lot of projection like structures okay this created a lot of projection like structures and these pro these projections okay are called as calyces or it is also called as calyx of the kidney now did you understand till now are you following or able to follow should i repeat anything suresh if i'm not wrong are you able to follow perfect okay let's move on okay so now you know that we understood you see we we saw one part what did we see we saw the anatomical region of where the kidney is present next we understood that the kidney is enclosed within a capsule like structure which is made up of three layers okay which is a fibrous capsule that encloses the whole of the kidney and we understood that there is a notch in the concave surface of the kidney which you call it as a hilum and we also understood that understanding this hilum uh, gave us an idea that oh the uh, the ureter before it was exiting the kidney it was it there was a conical or funnel like structure which is called as renal pelvis and the renal pelvis have projections which is called as a calyx okay now coming to let us say that we take a cross section of our kidney when we take a cross section of our kidney, it is very easy to notice that there is a complete continuous layer that is the outer capsule, okay, or uh, the, the capsule is present. Now, uh, within this capsule, okay, within the capsule region, what you can see is the internal region of the kidney. Once you take the cross section, we can clearly see that the internal uh, section of the kidney can be divided into two anatomical regions. What are those? The two anatomical regions are the peripheral cortex. Periphery means boundary. Okay, periphery means what? Boundary. So you can see that all the things that are marked in the red, okay, this is called as a peripheral region. So this region is called as the cortex region of the kidney, whereas the peripheral cortex and inner, inner medulla. So the inner to the peripheral cortex is the medullary region. Okay, so we have outer cortex or peripheral cortex and inner medulla. So when we take the cross section, the internal part of the kidney you know, divides into can be divided into two anatomical regions. One is the outer cortex and inner medulla. There is a reason why we have to talk about the cortical regions and the medullary regions. The simple reason is because if you see the cortex region, the cortex region is where the nephrons are situated, and this is where the filtration process is happening at a very high. Uh, rate 
and if you see the medullary region medullary region is where the filtrate is extracted and the urine uh, urine is concentrated i mean like concentrated means collected and then it is passed down to the ureter okay we'll talk about it that is where we can divide this to our convenience into two important regions okay now coming to the medullary regions first we'll talk talk from the inner medulla and then we go for the outer cortex if you see the medullary regions what you can see can you see that there are conical regions that are present okay there are around 8 to 12 conical projections that are present within the medulla regions so this 8 to 12 uh, conical projections that are present within the medulla regions they are called as renal pyramids what are they called as renal pyramids so these renal pyramids also have name or uh, can also be called as medullary pyramids because they are present in the medulla region of the kidney okay now these these renal pyramids you can see that they are clearly connected to the calluses correct right what did we discuss about callus we understood that there is a funnel like structure this we call it as renal pelvis and the renal pelvis has a projection called as calluses or the calyx and the calyx is connected to what it is connected to these pyramids what are these pyramids called as these pyramids are called as renal pyramids or it is also called as medullary pyramids now if you see these medullary pyramids can you see that there is something between these medullary pyramids yes so these medullary pyramids are divided or or they are separated by column like structures correct right so they are separated by column like structures so these gaps you okay, can see here which are those gaps i am talking about so these gaps okay these gaps which are filling or which are separating one pyramid to the other pyramid so this region is called as renal columns what are they called as they are renal columns and they are also called as columns of bertini so usually people get um, confused when columns of bertini is mentioned so whenever the columns of bertini is mentioned you should understand that they are nothing but you know or columns uh, or they are they are nothing but renal columns understood okay so can we get back once again what did we understand so the kidney has an outer capsule and within the capsule the internal structure of the kidney or the cross section of the kidney uh, we can understand that it can be divided into two important anatomical sections one is the peripheral cortex or the outer cortex and the inner medulla right so within the inner medulla there are conical masses and these conical masses are called as what medullary pyramids pyramid is what it's like a triangular cone like a conical uh, triangular structure it's not triangular but if you, when you see in the 2d structure you can see that it's triangular so that's why we call it as medullary pyramids medullary pyramids are also called as what renal pyramids so what are these pyramids are connected to the pyramids are connected to the calyx so where are the calyx coming from calyx are the projections of renal pelvis so the renal pelvis leads to what renal pelvis leads to ureter understood so you can see a map now okay now if the urine formation is happening here it is going through this and it comes through the calyx it comes through the uh, renal pelvis and finally it goes through the ureter correct simple map so the, if you follow this map it becomes very very easy to understand the mechanism of the kidney understood students okay now these as i told you these pyramids project into the calyces and these pyramids are divided okay or or they are extended between these pyramids the extensions between these pyramids are called as renal columns or it's also called as columns of bertini now the major or the important uh, functional part or i can tell the, the most functional part of the kidney is the nephrons so you might have heard about this nephron nephrons are the filtration unit of the kidney or we have we would have thought that nephrons are the functional unit of the kidney of course yes because if you see the cortex region is filled with nephrons so each kidney has around 1 million uh, you know uh, tubular nephrons if i say 1 million that is equal to 10 lakh nephrons in each kidney okay so uh, each nephron can be divided into two structures okay one is the glomerular structure you can see that there's a ball like structure so we can call it as grow glomerular structure and the other one is it's like a pipeline so you can see that there are lots of tubular structures that are present within the nephron well, a very easy to understand nephron structure okay so we'll talk about it so you can see that there are tubular structures which we call it as renal tubule structure okay nephron can be divided into two important regions one is a glomerulus region and the second one is the renal tubule region 
so this is about uh, the nephron not the complete part of the nephron the, uh, the just the understanding of the nephron now understand the students when you look at the uh, structure of the kidney like this is how the kidney uh, not really but i can i'm just trying to represent okay so sorry uh sorry wait it's better i take it back here so if you understand the structure of the kidney you can see here this is the region where the blood vessels enter let's say that we have renal artery and renal vein so this renal artery and renal vein is coming from the outside okay so whenever it is coming from the outside it is called as afferent okay it is called as afferent out to in is called as what afferent whereas if it is uh, in to out inside to outside it is called as efferent okay inside to outside is called as what efferent outside to inside is called as what afferent so let's see what is happening here now once the blood see we have the blood vessels the blood vessels from our uh, systemic circulation it uh, is from the renal circulation it enters through our kidneys so once these arteries or the veins okay arterioles they enter into the kidney what happens is they divide see arteries becomes smaller arteries smaller arteries become smaller arterioles and the smaller arterioles become micro capillaries they're very very thin capillary like structures so see here this afferent artery comes into one point and it divides and redivides to form the capillary like structure and they form a tuft or a complex network of tubules okay or a ball of tubules tuft of tubules or complex network of tubules okay and finally they exit the same region okay as efferent arterioles see outside it is coming as afferent arteriole they divide and redivide and form a tuft uh, of capillaries the capillaries join and become uh, become bigger and bigger arteries and they exit as efferent arteriole so this is going inside this is going outside so once the efferent arteriole comes okay within it forms a fine branch i told you of renal artery now what happens here is the blood that is carried from the afferent arteriole okay as they are pushed into smaller and smaller and smaller capillaries it creates a lot of pressure okay and also a filtration medium to uh, you know filter the blood so for that uh, we need uh, accessory structures we need more support or we need more uh, complex structures to make it happen so once we know that the blood vessels are coming and they are forming a tuft like capillary uh, network and this capillary network is what uh, keeps this, uh, you know, uh, like arteries to bring the blood. And then they, uh, and then the some filtration is happening, and the blood returns back through efferent arterial. Now, if you see that uh, around this tuft of capillaries that is formed, there is a capsule that encloses this tuft of capillaries, and this capsule is uh, called as Bowman's capsule. Okay, this capsule or a wall around this capillary network, it is called as Bowman's capsule. Understood? So we have a glomerulus, which is a tuft of blood capillaries. And around the glomerulus, what do we have? We have Bowman's capsule. And understand this, there is a space, there is a space, okay? Uh, the lumen of Bowman's capsule, we call it as. So this lumen is a space where the filtered filtration okay once the blood is gone all the filtrate what we extract is poured into this lumen okay so now the glomerulus this glomerulus plus the bowman's capsule that is around it this entire body together it is called as morphigan body or it is also called as renal corpuscle very very important point there was a question the renal corpuscle is composed of dash uh, okay, what are the different things that are uh, within the renal corpuscle? Several options were given, but your right option is what is renal corpuscle? Renal corpuscle is nothing but the glomerulus plus the Bowman's capsule. Together, it forms something called as renal corpuscle. Mostly, they ask this term with renal corpuscule. Um, uh, very few times I have seen this 
a, a word called as malfigan body in in the examination okay but it's best you remember both of the things what are those first you have to remember malfigan body is what it is a combination of glomerulus and bowman's capsule together is called as bo malfigan body what is renal corpuscle another name for malfigan body okay now this tube okay this tube what happens is uh, uh, see once this we have afferent, afferent arteriole it forms this uh, you know tuft of uh, glomerulus and the glomerulus exits out as efferent now is this a, this is the only job yes of course now as it entered and exited what it created is the bowman's capsule has created some filtrate okay some of the things that are filtered out of the blood so we'll talk about it so this filtrate flows into convoluted tubules convoluted tubules means highly and straight but it is coiled okay coiled structures are called as convolutions okay so it enters into a convoluted or a very coiled structures okay so this coiled convolution is called as pct or proximal convoluted tubule okay or it is also just called as proximal tubule this proximal means what at the beginning distal means what at the end so proximal to the uh, you know glomerulus uh, or the bowman's capsule is what proximal convoluted tubule or at the end what is there distal convoluted we'll talk about it so once it exited or the once the filtrate exits the bowman's capsule what do we get we get a very highly convoluted tubules and this highly convoluted tubule is called as proximal convoluted tubule so the proximal convoluted tubule at the terminal end of the proximal convoluted tubule it leads into a u or a hairpin like structure or it is also called as henley's loop okay or loop of henley so this loop of henley or a hairpin like shaped structure it descends from through the proximal convoluted tubule you see it descends first and it takes a sharp u turn and then it ascends up so whichever the region it descends it is called as descending limb of henley whichever it is going up it is called as ascending limb of henley remember that these loop of henley have a very important role in concentrating the urine understood next once it descends and ascends the ascending limb leads to the final part of your convolution that is called as distal convoluted tubule so the distal convoluted tubule comes at the terminal region of our ascending limb now once we have the distal convoluted tubule finally the distal convoluted tubule will lead into something called as collecting ducts and the several collecting ducts from several nephrons come together form a network and they lead you into the bladder actually not the bladder we should go back and map here so what is our map say it comes through this uh, you know several collecting ducts are present in the renal pyramids and the renal pyramids collect all these collecting ducts and they pour into the calyx of the kidney from the calyx they go to the renal pelvis from the renal pelvis they go to the sorry uh, from the renal pelvis they go to the excuse me yeah from the renal pelvis they go to the ureter so this is the way it, it passes okay urine passes anyways so what did we understand here from the distal convoluted it leads to the collecting ducts and the collecting ducts from several kidneys come together okay uh, uh, from some several nephrons not kidneys from several nephrons come together and then uh, they collect at one point uh, that is the renal pelvis okay so fine so this is about how the nephron structure okay what is the structure of the nephron okay what did we understand the structure uh, structure of nephron so we understood that once the art artery getting into your kidney it divides and redivides and redivides into smaller and smaller and smaller blood vessels once it enters okay what brings the blood is called as afferent artery the afferent artery uh, arteriole we call it as because it's very very small the afferent arteriole enters and it divides and divides and divides and forms a fine network which we call it as a glomerulus and it exits as the afferent arteriole and along um, uh, around this glomerulus is a tuft or, or a capsule which we call it as bowman's capsule the bowman's capsule and the glomerulus together is called as renal corpuscle and the glomerulus opens into a highly convoluted structure called as a pct or a proximal convoluted tubule the proximal convoluted tubule it leads into u-shaped hairpin like structure called as loop of henley or henley's loop 
So the Henle loop has descending limb as well as the ascending limb. Finally, the loop of Henle, uh, uh, the ascending limb of uh, loop of Henle leads into distal convoluted tubule, and after the final convolution, it finally leads into the collecting duct, and the collecting duct can be coming from several nephrons, uh, neighboring nephrons, and they form this uh, bigger and bigger ducts that carry the uh, urine from the nephrons all the way till the renal pelvis, okay? So this is about the structure of nephron, okay? So you see here, did you understand? Are you able to follow? Yes, one second. Oh, you are Rina. Okay, hi Rina. I it's it was Suresh, so I thought it is Suresh. Okay. Are you able to follow? Can I can I continue? Yeah. So coming to the final differentiation of kidney, how we can understand the kidney. See, uh, we know that the collecting duct is a very important uh, part of the kidney. Okay, now some of the kidney, what you can see is uh, uh, there are two different kidneys. So let me have a better diagram. Do we have a better diagram here? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, so some of the kidneys, what happens based on the collecting ducts? So you can see that some, some kidneys are, see, majority of the kidneys are present in which region? Cortex region, correct, right? So some of the kidneys, what they do is they're collecting ducts from the cortex region they extend into the inner part of the medulla. That means this is the cortex region. They are extending down into the medullary region. Or you see, you can see that the collecting ducts are entering into the medullary region. So whenever they go beyond the medullary, I mean, like they go into the medullary region, okay, and they open into renal pelvis and medullary pyramids. Correct, right? So hold on, hold on. I thought I was talking about differentiation of kidneys. So let's not talk about the differentiation of kidneys now. Um, there is something else we have to discuss. Okay, anyways. So now you see here, uh, that's what I was trying to talk, why this slide is showing like this. Okay, okay, fine, 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 fine. Uh, sorry, I missed a little bit part. Uh, anyways, so you can see here, uh, this how the renal pelvis um, through the Malfigan pyramids and finally into the calluses, uh, how the urine passes, right? Now, when we talk about the Malfigan body and the PCT and the DCT, all of them are present in the cortical region of the kidney. You can see all of them are present in the cortical region. And the loop of Henle sometimes extends into the uh, medulla and sometimes it does not extend into the medulla. And based on that also, we can differentiate the kidney. Okay, now whatever the afferent arteriole that was coming into the glomerulus, afferent means what? That is outside to inside. So that was coming into the kidney. And then once it forms a fine capillary network or the peritubular network, okay, so what it does once a uh, afferent arteriole comes and uh, emerges into the glomerular and it forms a fine capillary, now again it forms a fine capillary kind of a network around the renal tubule. So these are the renal tubules, right? So around the renal tubule, you can see here. So this is your afferent arteriole. So this is your afferent arteriole. A part of an afferent arteriole has become the glomerulus. And the another part of an afferent arteriole, they form a fine network like structure around your entire renal tubules. It doesn't matter whether it is PCT, whether it is DCT, whether it is loop of Henle, nothing. Okay, it forms a very fine net-like structure or network-like structure. Okay, the same capillary-like like structure that is formed by the afferent arteriole is also called as vasa recta. Remember this, the U-shaped network that is formed by the cap capillary network that is formed by your blood vessel, okay, or the afferent arteriole is also called as vasa recta. Where can I call this as vasa recta? I can call this as vasa recta only when this network or the mesh like U-shaped structure is present around the loop of Henle. When they are present around the loop of Henle, they are called as what? Vasa recta. Understood? You, you understood, right? So this is about uh, your uh, capillary networks or it is also called as uh, vasa recta. Okay. Yeah. This is the important thing that you have to remember. 
the majority of the nephrons that are present in the kidney are what type of nephrons the answer is they are called as cortical nephrons why they are called, called as cortical nephrons the reason is very simple they have a very short loop of henle now when they have very short loop of henle this is the cortex region okay and this is the medulla region okay uh, so when they have uh, sorry this is the medulla region so the loop of henle the barely it reaches the medulla region so these type of uh, kidneys are called as cortical nephrons whereas if you see the medullary nephrons the medullary nephrons is also called as juxtra medullary nephrons why they called as juxtra medullary nephrons because they extend from the cortical region all the way till the medulla they go deep into the medullary region okay uh, so uh, this loop of henle is very very long and they run deep into the medulla okay so here the main difference is the vasa recta is present and the vasa recta is absent or it is highly reduced so remember majority of the nephrons are cortical nephrons and minority that is 15% of the nephrons is juxta medullary nephrons here in the cortical nephrons the vasa recta is highly reduced and the juxta medullary nephrons the vasa recta is highly enhanced or it is present prominently understood very very important what are the two different types of nephrons and which of the nephrons is highest in number or what is the name of the nephrons that is present in the cortical region or what is juxta medullary nephrons or they may they may ask you uh, choose the uh, uh, right statement with respect to nephrons in that statements they might give you juxta medullary nephrons are present in very high number or cortical nephrons have very uh, well defined vasa recta so they might confuse you remember this cortical nephrons 85% in number very short loop of henle they extend very little into the i can't tell that they don't extend at all into the medullary region they extend but very little into the medullary region vasa recta is absent or it is highly reduced in cortical nephrons whereas juxta it is only 50% 15% the loop of henle is very enhanced or long it runs deep into the medulla and vasa recta is present okay did you understand yeah so chalo so now we have to talk about mechanism of urine formation and uh, for that we will continue in the next class because the time will be over by the time i finish this and for the next class it will be late for you people okay is it fine